We are in the second Sunday of Advent, talking about John the Baptist. That's who our focus is today. Our text in Mark chapter 1 talks all about this guy named John who comes before Christ to prepare the way of the Lord. That's our focus today. But I want to know, how well are you guys prepared for Christmas? Are you ready? Are you prepared? Did you get all your boxes out of the attic, like 12 of them? <laughs> Did you get everything put away and put where it's supposed to be, every little ornament where they're supposed to go, every little nutcracker, every little Disney thing that sings? You guys get all those? Did you guys get your, uh, your tree? Did you go to the mountains or go to a tree farm? You got your tree up. Maybe you have an artificial tree that you had to also lug down from the attic. And you got to set up that tree. You got to decorate that tree. And then your wife swears that there was a box of ornaments missing. So you have to go back to all of the, of the, the boxes you had to get out of the attic and go find it. Is that just me? <laughs> Turns out the kids had just grabbed it. It was in the living room. But then you got the lights. You had to put up all the lights. And of course, some of the lights don't work. So you got to go get new lights. And you got to get up on the ladder. And you got to go down the ladder, up the ladder, down the ladder, up the ladder. Anybody? Are you ready? Are you prepared? And I'm not even talking about the gifts that you got to get everybody. You got nieces and nephews. You got to get one gift for every person you ever know in your life, right? And you spent $26 on one kid, you got to spend $13 on the other. Do you love the other kid more? No. Are you ready? Are you prepared? Have you picked out the perfect menu to cook that day? Have you got all your walnuts? <laughs> Are you ready? See, I love our text in Mark chapter 1. It's interesting that Mark chapter 1 pops up in our Advent readings because Mark starts not with the birth story of Jesus. It starts with John the Baptist, which is peculiar, right? You'd think we'd get baby Jesus when we're talking about the coming of Christmas. But instead, we're going to take a time and moment to talk about the one who's come to prepare the way for Jesus, John the Baptizer. That's our focus today. Mark chapter 1 starts off awesome. This is the beginning of the good news of Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God. And then it talk, talks about the prophecy from Isaiah, from Malachi, about this one who's going to go out in the wilderness. And this one who's going out in the wilderness is John. John goes into the wilderness. Not only does John go out into the wilderness, he's also kind of a wild man. It says that he's dressed in like camel's hair, got a leather belt for a strap. He's eating locusts and honey. And you're probably wondering, why are they describing his attire and his appetite? Well, what is this all about? What is Mark getting at? And he's specifically saying these things because this is exactly how Elijah, the prophet, dressed and ate. And so he's hearkening back to that prophet to show us that John is the last Old Testament prophet. He is the last one to come before Jesus. He's the last one. He's the prophet who goes into the wilderness. And the wilderness is important. For us in the Northwest, I think we're blessed with the wilderness. We actually call it a fun time going camping out in the middle of nowhere with nothing but trees and lakes and rivers. But we're blessed because there's lots of life, there's lots of sustenance, there's lots of animals. But over there, the wilderness is a desolate place. It's hot. There's no water. There's no life. If there is some kind of plant, it's got thorns on it. And yet that's where John goes. John goes out into the wilderness. Why? Why wouldn't he be in the middle of the temple? If his job is to be the forerunner to Christ, if he's the one to talk about the coming of the Lord, why would he not go in the middle of the religious center? Why would he go out into the wilderness? Because this is where God meets his people. I mean, think about all of our Old Testament stories. 
Jacob, after he steals his birthright from his brother, goes out in the middle of the wilderness where literally he lays down his head on a pillow, no, a rock. That's the kind of wilderness that he's in when a rock is a pillow and God meets him in a dream. God meets him again in the wilderness when he's trying to wrestle. He thinks his brother, but turns out it's God. God meets Moses, not in the middle of all the Egyptian pyramids and the height of civilization. He meets him in the wilderness, in the burning bush. God meets his own people, the Israelites, after they get scared with all the, the large people in the promised land. In the middle of the wilderness that they're wandering for 40 years, God meets them with water from a rock, with manna and quail to eat every day. God meets his people in the midst of the wilderness. Maybe you're in your own wilderness. Maybe you feel like you're in some desolate place in life. Maybe you feel the sun scorching on your back. Your lips are chapped. You're, you're thirsty. You feel like you can't go on. You feel like there's no life in you. There's no life around you. Maybe you're in that place. And that, my friends, is where God tends to meet us. It's in the moment of our weakness, in the moments when we feel like we're at rock bottom. God meets us there. God meets us through his own son as a baby in the middle of of the hurts and heartbreak and pain and suffering, God shows up in the wilderness. And John, he's out there in the wilderness, looking like the wild man that he is, and he's preaching. He's calling the people to repentance, and they would get baptized and forgiven of all of their sins. See, John prepares the way. This is what John is doing. And I know in our, in our season of Christmas, we feel like we have to like prepare the way for Jesus to come on Christmas morning. Maybe you feel that. Maybe you feel like, man, I gotta, I gotta read my Bible more. I gotta pray more. I should probably give more money to the church and charity. I gotta do all these things more in order to prepare the way for Jesus to come on Christmas day. You're going through all that checklist, decorations and lights and presents and food. But don't take away John's job. See, John is the one to come before Christ. That's his job. That's his task. His job is to be there and say, hey, Jesus is coming. Your God is coming. Make straight the path. Make the mountains be lower, the valleys be raised, this crooked path made straight. His job is to preach that Christ is coming. But he gives the people a task. He tells them to repent, to literally turn away from their sin and to turn towards God to receive the forgiveness of their sins. So our task for us in this season of Advent as we prepare for Christmas is to repent. It's to own up to the things that we've done in our life, to be exposed essentially of all the sin and the hurt and the heartbreak that we've caused and to seek the mercy and grace of Jesus Christ. Because here's the really good news. The call to repentance is always a message of hope. We're not putting it in a wish list. It's not like we're sitting there going, man, I wish that I got this for Christmas. I wish that someone would buy this for me. I wish that I would get cash, or I wish that I would get clothes. No. We're not sitting here thinking, I wish I get forgiven. No, no, no. Our hope is in something sure and good. Our hope is in the one whom John has prepared the way for, the one who is the Messiah, the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who does forgive us of our sins. And John calls the people there to be baptized, to be washed with the water, to be forgiven of their sins so that Jesus can come in. 
and mess up their lives in all the good ways. Repentance is always a good thing for me and for you. If you do one thing in this Christmas season, repent. There is hope for you found in your repentance. There is forgiveness found for you because our hope is anchored in something not of this world, not something that will fade away, but in something that endures forever, and that is the mercy and grace of Jesus Christ that he won on the cross for you. That's what our hope is in, and the promise that Christ gives each and every day, I will forgive you. And I love John. I love John because he's always pointing to Jesus. Whenever you see paintings of him, he's got this finger pointed out there, pointing. There's a reason. Because John says, one's coming who's greater than me. One is coming. John points to a greater hope. And he even says, this person who's coming, I'm unworthy to untie their shoes. Which is quite the statement. Because back then, when they had their sandals, the people that could actually untie the the sandals were those who were slaves, those who were the lowest of low on the society. Those people could untie the shoes. Because the shoes were gross, guys. They're not clean like we are in this day and age. They didn't have bathrooms and toilets. They just kind of dumped it everywhere, guys. And they walked in it. So when you show up, Oh, I ain't changing your shoes, so I'm not going to untie it. The slaves had to do it. And yet John, who Jesus says is like the greatest guy ever, says, I'm unworthy to even untie Jesus' sandals. That's how great and mighty God is. But the one who is there to pave the way and prepare the way says, I'm unworthy, I can't do it. And he tells us, John says, I I baptize with water. But Jesus is going to baptize you with the Holy Spirit. The one who was conceived by the Holy Spirit. The one who was born by the Holy Spirit. The one who was growing in the Holy Spirit. The one who healed and teached and, and preached in the Holy Spirit. The one who died and then rose from the grave victoriously through the Spirit, then gives us the Spirit on the day of Pentecost. And because we have the Spirit, because we have the full triune God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, so when we're met with the waters of baptism, there is an even greater hope than what John was giving to the people. He gives us a hope that is rooted in the death and resurrection of Jesus. And that, my friends, when you're washed by that water, you are made new. Your sins are forgiven. You're a part of the body of Christ. You're adopted as if you were sons and daughters fully. You have the full inheritance. And so we have hope, true hope, in this season that feels like a wilderness, where we feel desolate and alone. We're washed day and day and day and day again in the waters of baptism by the blood of Jesus Christ. That is our greatest hope. That is why John continues to point to Jesus. Look to him, not to me. If you're going to look to me, I'm going to point to him so you can see the Savior of the world, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. I'll close with this. The other day, I was playing hide-and-seek with my kids, which is fun with a three-year-old and a a -a one-and-a-half-year-old. They go off and hide in the house. I count to 10, and I say, ready or not, here I come. And I start searching. They're not in the living room. They're not in Zeke's room. They're not in Haley's room. They're in mom and dad's room. You can hear them kind of giggling. I get into the room, and Zeke literally is by my dresser, and he's just crouched like this. I can see him. (laughs) He didn't even try to hide behind the dresser. But the best part was Haley. 
I turn to the right, and Haley is in the middle of the room, like this. <laughs> if she can't see me, I can't see her. <laughs> but that's what it's like for Jesus. Ready or not, here he comes. And we get to be like toddlers, young children, who are not hiding in the midst of our sin, not trying to be shamed and filled with guilt and try to get away from the Savior of the world, but instead we're out there in the open saying, I'm right here. <laughs> Come on, God. Because when we're out there in the open and we repent of our sins and we confess it, God gives us forgiveness time and time again. May you, in this season of Advent, look to John, who points to Jesus, who Jesus, who went to the cross and died for your sins, went to the grave and rose victorious, says, you are forgiven. Time and time again, repent. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. He is here, ready or not. He is coming. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you that you are a God who meets us in the midst of the wilderness, in the midst of desolate and isolating places. Thank you, Lord, that you sent your, your prophet John to preach the good news that Jesus is coming. And thank you, Lord, that he is here and that he has made a way and that he has forgiven us of all of our sins and he washes us in the waters of baptism. Lord, may we cling to you in this season of Advent as we get nearer and nearer to Christmas. May we trust in your promise that is good and sure that you have died and risen for this world, for me, for all the people here. Thank you, Lord. We love you. We pray this all in your great and your beautiful name. Amen.